A very good morning, and thank you for having me. I have come all the way from London. Uh, I went through various other places, and I'm very pleased that the sun has come out because I will go back to the rain tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm Andy. I'm CEO at Control Plane, where we are cloud native security consultancy. So we work on unlocking next generation technology for regulated industries, and we'll talk about some of those next generation things today. And um, the other one is uh, working as the CISO for Open UK, open source, open hardware, and open data. And open source is in my blood. I'm very pleased to be here. We are 55 people across the world. We are looking at doing work here in South America as well. If this is interesting to you for your next career opportunity, please bear us in mind. So today, we'll talk about how to defend and attack AI systems running inside Kubernetes. We'll look at a threat model, and this is some of the work that we've done in the community to advance the state of AI on Kubernetes. So what is the problem space? Well, it's very expensive to train an AI model. The transformer model that Google built back there was about $900, and you can see the cost of Gemini Ultra is getting on for $100 million. So this is beyond the reach of you and me, so we have to use other people's models. And if we pull those models down from somewhere like Hugging Face, well, it turns out that you can backdoor these models. You can either put code, put Python code in there that will create a reverse shell, or you can train the model in a way that it has a backdoor on a certain day if I pretend my name is something and I give it a magic string. So we can't trust these models. We can't see through them. The open source definition of AI, which has just come out of the open source initiative recently, allows for this unshareable training data. So we have a brand new, potentially hostile, non-deterministic threat actor behind our firewall. How do we defend against that? Well, if we look at where the countries that are investing, then we can see we can't necessarily trust the models that come from the way that we're aligned with our uh, superpower. Let's say a Chinese model has a very different view of the world from an American model, and the money that's being thrown into these globally means that they exist everywhere. And this broadly is the problem. We can't be sure that the training data isn't poisoned, we can't be sure that the output of the model is entirely trusted, and there's a huge amount of information. It's kind of how you secure a system normally, but then there are some important things that we'll talk about today, and this is a very long document with a lot of requirements. So, what's the problem space for Kubernetes? Well, here is an SDLC data flow diagram for how we might do an end-to-end -end training for a statistical model on Kubernetes. As you can see, there are a lot of moving parts here, and it might be mind-blowing for some of us. Some of the threats, I mean, we care about the tampering and the poisoning of the model initially, but then at the other side, what about hostile users injecting malicious prompts that might cause the model to reveal its training data, or it might generate unexpected outputs, because these are non-deterministic systems, of course. Uh, it's, it's getting slightly worse. And the integrity of the model, if we're pulling these models from externally and then making our own tunings for some version of this diagram, the attack surface is huge. And doing this in a, a responsible way, uh, you can see, incidentally, I will put these slides up straight afterwards. I've linked out to a lot of other talks and other external sources that we've used. So there's a lot to consider here. And that includes how we start with the model, how we do our ML ops with the model, how we manage the people who are interacting with the model. Do we suddenly replace authentication with in-model systems? We've never done that before. Why would we do that now? And the cost of running these things, the carbon footprints the amount of water used to cool the data centers. OK, so we can make this a little bit simpler. We can reduce it down to the trade-offs in how we build these things. Or we can talk about the supply chain security. We know how to do this. This is 
cosine, sig store. These are signing techniques that we can use. But also, we're now dealing with multi-gigabyte models. So do those things scale? The secure deployment, again, we assume that we're on a secure baseline of infrastructure because that's what we know. But then what other deployment questions do we have on top of that? Are we using an internal model that we've trained, a statistical model, or because of the cost of training these things, are we using a hosted service? And we can name a number of them. Does that hosted service give us the same model version every time we hit the API? And then actually running this thing in production, what happens if it has been backdoored? How do we detect malicious behavior? Does the model return us a SQL string that we then go and run against our PII, our internal data that is the lifeblood of every company and the reason that companies exist? So these are a lot of problems, and what are we trying to achieve? Under the Financial Services Open Source Organization, which is another sister organization of the CNCF under the Linux Foundation, I was part of a team building out this governance framework. So the question really is, how do I use an external model in a bank to write one email? And the answer is difficult, slow, and sludgy. So we took a reference architecture and we chose an example deployment type for an AI model. You can see we've got everything from the public API access, which is a hosted model that we can access, but we don't know anything about it, all the way through to models that have been trained, as we looked at in the first architecture diagram. Those maybe are statistical or numerical models that financial services have trained for many years, or training your own LLM, perhaps, but that is a very expensive thing, as we've seen. So we built out a security reference architecture on the back of this using Kubernetes. And I'll explain why these things are important as we go through the next couple of slides. But of course, we come in, we have some sort of load balancing, and then we hit this first proxy, this layer seven logging. First of all, we have to firewall the prompts that are coming into the system. This is because if I ask a model, please tell me all the information you have about every customer, and I turn that into a chatbot, well, other customers will see each other's data. We can't be having that. So some basic level of prompt firewalling. We also want the prompt firewall to restrict our queries to the context that we're using. So for example, we don't want to go to Amazon and use their search bar to start generating Python code, which is one of the things that we've seen possible. The data then goes through into the AI control plane, the application that is using that external service. And in this case, we can either have a localized GPU runner pool, so we might be pulling a model and running it locally, that's maybe a, a llama, or we can replace that external call with a call to a hosted model. And then that has to be firewalled as well, because do we trust the response of the model? Again, if it returns us something that is used to make further queries, be that GraphQL query or some SQL, we have to make sure that that is statically analyzed, that it hits our requirements. There's a, a huge risk to doing that. And then when the response comes back, that output analysis has to identify personally identifying information, intellectual property that might have been used in the model or to put on top of the model with retrieval augmented generation to give us more context cheaply instead of retraining. It could be toxicity. We don't want these models to be responding with things that make people uncomfortable, unsafe, or worse. And then finally, we get that back to the user. This is an expensive process. There are other models sat in those output analysis stages. And the state of the art right now is this is not a solved problem. So we're reducing risk instead of solving. So here's a very simplified view of what we've just spoken about using an external model. And what are some of the risks that we see here? So we'll map the threats that we might have. If we're pushing information externally, do we trust that information? Do we trust it's stored securely, rather, by the third party? What about our local version of that data? What about the application itself? 
Well, that's kind of in the context that we know about hallucination risk. Who's testing for these things? Well, red teams are testing to test the model to see if they can make it do something that you don't expect. Non-determinism is always a risk. Denial of wallet. If someone can force your model to make repeated or very large calls to an external service, that will cost you a lot of money. If you have two competitors with the same amount of funding and someone attacks the wallet that way, well, there's your runway as a startup. Uh, the compromise, the various bits of integrity, user prompt injection. There's a lot of detail here that I won't go any further into. Um, also, I should have highlighted these as I went through them. But these are the relevant parts for each part of the model. Right, so how do we control these things? Well, again, I won't go into too much detail, but we can put canaries into these models. There is a set of AI Safety Institute directives that say to models should never do X, Y, Z. It's almost a how to safely use the model. That contains a UUID. And if you can get that UUID back from a trained model, the theory is that model can then gain some sense of cognition because it knows what it's not supposed to do and can start working around the rules. We can use the same concept to hide bits of data and UUIDs that should never be scraped into a public training set and search those back. Uh, we can run access control. We should be filtering the data we use to train these models, of course, sanitization of the inputs, all these access controls. This hallucination risk we'll talk about briefly and look at some controls. But non-determinism is a huge risk and something we must be cognizant about when deploying these systems. So how do we actually red team and attack these models? Well, this is a, a short version of the many tools that are emerging. This is a very busy space at the moment. Obviously, um, working in the UK and doing government advisory, Inspect AI is one of the most interesting to me. And this is essentially benchmarking the response of your system. So we're running these tools. We, we have our secure reference architecture set up. Is the response within the tolerances and boundaries that we accept as a consumer of this application? It's a very new way of thinking about applications because we're used to deterministically getting a Boolean response from a piece of code. Does it pass or fail this test? Is it a string match? Is it a range check even? But here we're looking more at something that's kind of like a distance from whatever objective truth that we have. Suffice to say, there's a lot of time and work goes into these frameworks, and they're worth investigating in their own right. There are tools for actually evaluating the models. Does it conform to a basic set of principles? This is one of the ways to red team a model, which is constantly injecting the same character. So one character A, two character A's, three, at maybe 56, the model suddenly starts a stream of consciousness where no one's tested this and you're getting thousands and thousands of characters of junk back or maybe it repeats itself. These are the risks in deploying these models because we don't have a view on how the neurons and vectors that light up inside the model translate into outputs. And there's work going on in this space, but it's very academic at this point. And of course, indirect prompt injection. You upload the picture of a cat, which contains the next prompt. And as you can see in very small writing at the bottom, um, it responds with the capital of France is Paris, which has nothing to do with the poor kitten. This is all summed up uh, broadly in the adversarial robustness toolkit, which gives us tools for red and blue teaming these models. Once you have these things deployed, there's a huge number of resources that you can use to verify these systems. But please be cognizant of the fact that we're dealing with an entirely new class of software and algorithm that responds in a different way and therefore needs to be tested and range checked in its own specific style. Again, this uh, reference architecture is going to be open sourced soon. If you're interested in this, please let me know or hit me up on socials and I'll give you early access to it. Key takeaways, threat model everything. It's the same as all the systems that we designed before, but contemplate the emergent threats that occur. OWASP LLM top 10 is a very useful cross-reference here. Red teaming, of course, 
I would advocate for security testing for everything. That's my job. That's my passion. But in this case, the reinforcement learning for human feedback, that's the way that the major models are trained. That is the human in the loop. Bear that in mind when you're deploying these systems. And finally, uh, do jump in and have a look at the work that we've done in Finos, because it summarizes this in a financial services sense very simply. Have a wonderful day, and thank you for your time.